Everyone loves a good true crime story. An investigative journalist and host of CounterClock, Delia de Ambra, is no different. In part two of Why We Love True Crime, Lindsay Boyd and Nathan Spell sit down with Delia to discuss what drew her and so many others to the podcast genre. So let's get started. That's the great thing about Stamps.com. They grow with you. As much fun as I had, I couldn't wait to get back to my sleep number bed. Yep. I love my third love bras. They're hands down the most comfortable bras I've ever owned. I love making Blue Apron. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's my me time. Adelia, thank you so much for joining us today. If you don't mind introducing yourself for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with you and your shows, that would be great. Yeah, so I am an investigative journalist and I work for Audio Chuck. Um, you know, I host and produce and help co-create some of the shows for Audio Chuck. And yeah, that's what I've been doing now for the last full time for the last year. So it's been fun. That's awesome. And one of those shows is Park Predators, right? Correct. <laughs> I, uh, funny story, I actually discovered that show um, right before it launched. I think I heard a, a spot for it, like a coming soon. But I was driving to Big Bend National Park at the time. And <laughs> I was thinking, oh, this sounds great for me, but maybe not on this trip. Yeah, man, I don't think that's one of those shows that you necessarily listen to driving into a national park. I think you do it when you're driving out, right? You've survived. Like, you're, you yes. know, you're good. <laughs> Obviously, everyone, like, we're all fans of true crime in general here. And I'm just kind of curious, what got you interested in true crime as a genre? Well, um, I worked as a television news reporter for six years, and so I was doing a lot of crime stories, you know, like real life true crime um, as my day job, you know, just being so, um, you know, involved in that kind of storytelling. But I really got interested in, you know, true crime documentaries and other podcasts, probably like in college, you know, like that that kind of time where I'm just sort of bored and I want to have something to listen to. I think that's just where it kind of like took hold for me. And I was, you know, majoring in journalism and I was really, you know, a hungry young journalist. And so it all kind of came together at that time. Um, I think the stories themselves, they're just so intriguing. It's its like, you know, they say, what is it? Truth is stranger than fiction or something like that. I mean, I think that's that's the grip of those stories for me. It's funny you say that because my first exposure to true crime podcasts were was in college. And as a creative writing major, that's one of the things we learned is like, you know, if you're writing a, a fictional story, you actually can't make it as strange as some of the true crime stories. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned that you've worked or you were working as a journalist in general before. What, what exactly at that point was it that made you make the switch or, or what was the sort of the moment where you decided to take that that leap into podcasting instead so i was working at the beginning of 2018 i was working a couple years into my career as a general assignment reporter and investigative reporter for television news stations nbc owned television news stations and i had been listening to a couple of true crime podcasts that were sort of you know the type where it's you kind of go with the host right you're sort of learning the story you're sort of learning what they're learning as they're learning it in real time so i got really into that and i thought you know i have the skill sets to not only tell stories and understand law enforcement and understand, you know, crime stories. But I feel like I could maybe help in some advocacy, right? So, you know, trying to get these stories that maybe somebody hasn't heard or get some attention to a really old cold case. How can I do that? How can I use, you know, what I'm good at uh, to make that happen? And so that's where I figured let me do it in the podcasting space because, you know, TV has such a limited, you know, time frame that you can get a message, you can get a story across, whether that's local TV or even like network programs, you're, you're, you're under the constraints of time. And so because of that, a lot of things can hit the cutting room floor, not for, you know, malicious reason, reasons, but because it's what you're working with. So I realized that podcasting had way more, you know, like they say in print, white space, right? You know, to, to write, so to speak, and to, to deliver the story and the message. So that's where I just said, I'm going to do this. And I want to do a, you know, a serialized story where it's episodes week to week. And it's focusing on, you know, really digging in and telling the full story. And so that's how it happened in Counter clock was created <laughs> yeah it sounds like the biggest things for true crime podcasts or that make true crime 
podcasts different from other true crime genres is what really attracted you the idea that i know for many listeners of true crime the advocacy thing is a huge part of why they listen the idea that there are these cold cases that that still are out there um i think that's really it's a really awesome kind of story of how you got in yeah I think it's the, the the delivering of details, really taking time with the story and, you know, not being rushed on putting it together and not being, you know, unable to contact certain people. Like, that's huge for me as a journalist. So podcasting really allows that. And I think a great forum that people listen to, you know, because people actually listen to these shows. You know, it's it's hard for people that aren't in the podcasting space to get that. But they're I mean, the audience is huge. And not only that, the demographic is huge. Like you can't get that in TV or even print. So for me, I was like, bingo, we got to do yeah. it. <laughs> and rather than squeezing it into a 30 second soundbite, like, you know, you have time to really dig in. What do you think it is that fascinates people, especially women, about true crime? Because they seem to be the uh, the biggest listeners. Yeah, I think, again, I think part of it is that advocacy piece. I, I have had experience working with a lot of women who work in the nonprofit space. And so um, not that men don't as well, but just in my personal experience. And I think that that advocacy piece is, you know, wanting to make a change. And, you know, I think in in terms of people that are involved in true crime podcasts, I do see a lot of female journalists sort of spearheading um, a lot of content in that space. But I think as far as the consumer, I just think it's, I don't know. I, I, I It's hard to really pin it down to one thing. But I mean, me and all my girlfriends and my sisters and my mom, like we know Dateline. Like when Dateline comes on, if it's like two minutes, I'm committed. Like I'm on the jury I'm ready like I need to know this story so I think it's just the sometimes it's that entertainment value but at the same time I think you know the really good productions that are out there people stick with because they see that there's a bigger cause and there's a bigger message and I think women are just drawn to that um not that men aren't but I just think a lot of women are I've actually read that ingesting true crime and and like horror stories even um give people with anxiety a way to like experience that anxiety in a safe setting. I know that that especially holds true for me. Do you feel that that holds true for other listeners? I do. I mean, I know just from being witness to the feedback for the shows that I do and and with our flagship show, Crime Junkie, like so many people write in and they say, you know, I really, you know, I, I identify with this victim or I identify with this um, person or this situation. Um, and I think it does. It does give people a space to kind of, I don't I just relate in a way, but then I also know too that so many of the shows and and you know the ones that I do and others, you can actually learn something from them, right? So there's a show that I have out right now called Dark Arenas, and several of those episodes are talking about what to do if your child is abducted. Like, what are the top ten things that like make a difference? And so yeah, that's I mean that's huge for for people to actually walk away with something and feel like they have they have learned something and that they've been able to deal with that anxiety of their child being abducted, which is a huge concern for a lot of parents or, you know, any sort of child sexual abuse material type influence in their life or child abuse. Like parents worry about that stuff. So if, if they can listen to a true crime show that teaches them useful things, I mean, that's 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 great. I think that that's a good thing. So some people don't want to necessarily have those conversations with their friends or family, but they'll listen to a podcast and go, wow, OK, I feel a lot better. I feel prepared. And that's I mean, that's really cool. I've also kind of found during some of my research into like the true crime genre as a whole that people have kind of found support groups within each other and within like the true crime community. Have you found that your listeners have kind of banded together in the same way? Yeah, I think there are a lot of people that, you know, they are victims of, you know, domestic violence or they are, you know, uh, victims. Uh, they, you know, they're part of that club that no one wants to be a part of, right? They've had a family member or a loved one that has been murdered. And so, yeah, sometimes, you know, you'll see these forums of people that really bond over a particular podcast, whether it be one of our shows or another, and they come together in social media groups and they and they post you know flyers and they raise money for billboards or whatever it is like I think there really is this amazing kindred spirit that people have within the true crime community who actually care and you know yeah there's always going to be people you know that just want to talk and 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 draw attention to themselves or whatever but for the most part like what I've seen is people that genuinely care and they they want to get right information out there and they want to mourn 
um, with others who mourn like they do. So, yeah, I think it's it's a really cool community that can be birthed from different genres, subgenres of the true crime genre. The unfortunate reality is there are so many crimes out there that could be covered. So how do you decide which stories to tell and, and whether that's certain crimes to focus on? Or, you know, I know Dark Arenas is, is definitely a different sort of take on, you know, this genre. So how do you decide what stories to tell in the first place? Well, you know, if a show is interview based, right, like Dark Arenas is an interview based show, I really look for, again, who are the people that I can I can have and, and write my content to that is advancing, um, you know, public knowledge and is, you know, trying to make a difference. So who are people that are, you know, going to have not just good sound bites, but they're actually going to be able to explain things that I don't know anything about. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an ATF agent, nor do I ever want to be. But I want to know how that that works and how the public can learn from it. For things that are are like counterclock, right, where it's, you know, it takes me a year or two years or more to do an investigation and, and, and like never ends. I look at, OK, I want to get the family's consent first. Like I want to be I want the blessing of this family and the people that it's ultimately comes down to. It's their story. And then I look for things for shows like that, like public documents. What can I ask? Access. What can I, you know, kind of get my wheels turning in? So that's kind of a thing that lets me sort of navigate what story I can really dig into and, and hopefully make a difference in. And then research based shows like Park Predators, it's more the concept, right? Like, yeah, these are crazy crime stories. And yes, national parks are dangerous, just like everywhere else. But if you're somebody who goes to those places often, um, that wasn't necessarily thinking about your surrounding as much. You know, you were thinking about your gear or what trail you were going to go on. Are you really thinking about the people you come in contact with? Are you really thinking about should you isolate yourself in one of those areas with someone that you can't really trust. I mean, so it's more of that like general thought process. So the research based shows are not as interview involved or document involved, but they are there's a bigger message behind them. Um, so, yeah, I kind of let all those things sort of guide me, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. And those are all I, I like that there are with those each of those shows that, you know, you're known for. There's like three very different um, motivations that I think the the through line of it all coming back to something that's really actionable in a way for someone on the other end, I think that's really, really cool as a, a listener to be able to take away, like, I understand now what someone who's maybe had to deal or investigate crimes, how they think about this, and I have more knowledge than I did. I was going to say, I think the true crime space is so is so littered with so many shows, right, that there are a lot that are very just like entertainment based. And so that doesn't mean that those shows are bad or wrong, but I just don't think people leave going, I'm glad I listened to that or that stuck in my brain so if something happens to me I'll remember that you know and like so like everything there's tons of content but what's the content that's really gonna stick with people that's what I want to be a part of with that in mind knowing the motivation that you have behind reporting these stories a couple questions these are kind of going together what would you say is the most frustrating story you've had to you know you've had to report on so far you've had to tell and um and with that let's not end on that note also like what what would you say is the best or the most satisfying story that you've gotten to tell? The most frustrating story, and I think it, until it is solved, will always be, is the unsolved murder of Denise Johnson from Counterclock Season 1. Um, that story will always be with me. I think about Denise every week. I never knew her in life, but our lives are intertwined forever now. So, you know, I think for me what's most frustrating is that I feel like there is so much there. There is so much there to be reinvestigated. I know that because I found it myself. So if I can find it in two years time or two and a half years time, how has so many decades gone by where nothing's been done? And then you add on any potential forensic uh, testing that can be done, which we know is light years from what it was in the 90s. So that's where the frustrations are for me of, you know, just how that case has was stuck for so long. And now we have these wheels turning that I'm like, let's keep it going. So that's probably the most frustrating case. The only other ones I think would fall into that category for me are even in the research based shows um, where I tend to run across this detail of like 
the whole um, state systems of parole and different laws on, oh my goodness, this person got out like 10 times. Like, or, you know, this is the law that says they only have to serve this much time for this crime. But if they were in another state, they'd be in prison for the rest of their life. I mean, the understanding of the law and interpreting it based on different states and countries, that frustrates me because I'm just like, oh, like, man, lives could have been sa- saved, you know, right? So... That always frustrates me, but then again, that's just the reality of life. Uh, No system is perfect. So, and then you asked me my least frustrating or my favorite was the second. (laughs) Yeah, so the most frustrating. uh, It sounds like you know the unsolved cases, and then you know I, I, I not to derail this, but it's the idea of the especially like when you hear about serial killers that are released. You know, I know that like those kind of murder cases where they're released. I'm sure that's super frustrating to hear about, but yeah. So let's not land on that. Um, (laughs) But what would you say, what what would you say is the most satisfying story that you've gotten to tell? Um, So far, um, I really do take a lot of uh, pride in Counterclock Season 2's investigation. Just what it became, which is, I feel like for those that have listened to the show and for me personally, we I've come to a pretty good sense of who I believe is responsible for, for that crime. And it's certainly not Clifton Spencer, who is, a, you know, a, a, an integral figure of that of that show series or season. So and then what we were able to do to help him and to, you know, a- allow people to understand like what really goes on in post-conviction proceedings. I just felt like it was very full circle and it ended up being something so much bigger than the initial story, especially again, for those that have listened that understand how it folds into the narrative of Denise Johnson's case and the time, you know, the decade that it happened in, in the same geographic area. So I just felt like it became really full bodied. And I just, I, it's, it's just really satisfying to kind of be able to end it. Like nothing can be tied up with a bow, but in my mind, I got closer than anyone has ever gotten, and that's good enough for me. So, yeah, that one's been awesome. And it's still kind of, I'm always, I talk to Clifton every week. I mean, you know, it's like it always, it'll always go on. So, <laughs> I know that earlier you mentioned that, um, you know, you want people to, to listen to your show and think, you know, I'm glad that I listened to that. What do you want your listeners to take away from each episode? I think you know, with Counterclock, right? I mean, I want them to listen to the next episode. I don't want them to drop off because I do want them to hear, you know, the whole story. Because again, I mean, something that's not in context is useless, right? So you got to listen to the whole deal to to understand what's really important and what's, oh my gosh, kind of moment. Again, I think I go back to like with Park Predators, like if one person just pays a little more attention and not that the victims in those stories didn't, right? I'm not saying that, you know, there's any fault of anybody's, any victim's fault. I just mean there's one or two things that we can just keep in our head that later you go, you know, oh, I think I heard that on that show. I'm not going to go down that path alone. Hey, that could save somebody's life. I mean, it, so it's, I think it goes back to that for me where I just want to like be a little bug in everyone's head and ear because not everybody has that. Not everybody has a parent or a loved one who's going to tell them, hey, you know, don't do this, don't do that because it's going to hurt you down down the line um, or it's going to get you in, you know, a world of trouble. So I kind of just feel like hope, you know, people take that from the shows and are reminded that like, you know, unsolved cases, there are real human people, not only that are the victims, but the families that live with that. I think that gets totally washed in a lot of times in the true crime uh, genre is the human stories behind the suffering that is so important. Like you see a vigil, you see some archived, you know, video or something, and it kind of just goes past your your brain. But if every episode you're hearing from that family member, they become a lot more real to you. So that's what I hope people understand from our shows. I know that I definitely <laughs> took some some thoughts away from from park predators because I have a tendency to go out by myself. I I do visit state parks and national parks a lot, and it just never occurred to me to maybe let someone know, like, hey, this is where I'm going, and maybe cell signal is not so great because it's not great in like Big Bend and in West Texas. So I'll check in with you, and if you don't hear from me, maybe maybe try to check in with me. I just it had never really 
crossed my mind before. Yeah. And one thing it's been really amazing with that show is I when it came out and we're about to come out with the second season this summer, I just got such a flood of response from the outdoors community, which I'm a huge outdoors woman, I guess you could say. <laughs> like me and my husband, we love the parks. We love fishing. We love, you know, hiking. Like that's our thing. We got married in a national park. So like all of these things are like so part of who I am. But so many of those people were like, you know, I was always so concerned about the elements, right? Like, and that's such a huge thing. We should be. But think about people who have nefarious um, intentions, right? They already have the literally landscape working with whatever their intention is, right? So if there's a cliff, if there's a secluded area, you know, that's not going to necessarily happen in a busy shopping mall. I mean, we know crimes happen in those places, but, you know, anyone that has, you know, malicious intent, they're going to use the surroundings and and parks and whatever, recreation spaces. Like, that's just one other thing that's like in their pocket that's to their advantage. And I think, yeah, like you said, thinking about that and remembering that so many outdoors people like email me and they're like, what? You know, like... Like, ah, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't go backcountry camping alone. I'm like, do it. But talk to somebody while you're out there before you leave. Like, have a date that you're coming back, you know. So that's been interesting. I'm glad to hear that it doesn't prevent you from going out. Like, I'm glad that it there's like practical, you know, like, okay, we can still go out to the parks. <laughs> we just have to, we have to take some, you know, smaller steps to be sure that people know that we're out there, that kind of a thing. Yeah. And I think like a lot of people, that's like the one question always people always ask me is like, oh, how do you tell, you know, do these stories and do what you do and like not be afraid of the world and not be afraid of, you know, nature or, you know, getting too deep with an investigation and all those things are true. Like I could be, but at the same time, like we all have to live our lives, right? Like we all have to have a good head on our shoulders and use, you know, exercise, caution and wisdom. And I just think it's, you know, you can't not live and enjoy those things. But at the same time, you can learn from stuff. That's a big part of it. Or at least I try and make it a big part of the, the episodes. We've talked a lot about um, the actual podcast themselves. I'm curious about your preparation. How do you prepare for each episode? So with Counterclock, like I said, like I'll start like a year in advance, right? Like all the producing, all the interviews, all the scheduling and everything, um, you know, just being in the field, being on the ground, talking with people. But once I have all that gathered, I then, um, it, well, and during that time and then afterwards, I usually for like four months, right? I'm just sitting, like immersing myself in public documents. Um, I've sat for weeks just organizing, reading through, highlighting uh, everything, you know, one for accuracy, right? But two for learning and seeing what's not been seen. So it's a, it's phases, it's phases of field work, it's phases of education, you know, educating myself in the material, and then it's phases of investigating, right? So I get a phone call, and suddenly it changes everything. So there's that happening. And then, you know, and then I just go into the the post-production stuff where I I sit down for a couple of weeks and I write the show, whether it's five episodes, 10 or 20, you know, I think that's just kind of my process, but I'm, I never like cut it off where I say like, okay, I've voiced everything. It's done. I'm not going back to change it. I'm changing stuff constantly. So <laughs> I, I, that's just part of the deal. I mean, for me, but the research base shows, you know, once I get a good idea of, you know, everything I want to include and what's important and it, writing that's a lot easier than than counterclock for example i actually i kind of wanted to ask a question that we didn't prepare i'm curious you know we've talked about how you prepare an episode and and how the process works and we've talked about like your motivation and interest i'm curious if you have any advice for you know some budding podcasters out there or some someone who might be looking into how to take their background in journalism, whether they're just coming out of college, how to move into the space, if you have any tips or advice for them. Yeah, I, I think my biggest thing, I, I talk to like a lot of new journalists all the time that are like, I want to be an investigative journalist. I'm like, great, be prepared for confrontation, be prepared to do the work. I mean, it takes me thousands and thousands and thousands of pages 
to read through stuff, but it's not like those are just delivered to me. I have to go out and seek them and battle via email with clerk's offices to get those things. So it takes a lot of work. And I think you just have to be willing to do the work and not just to do it so you have it and it's off your checklist, but because you actually want to know that what you've been told by so-and-so or more than one person is the truth. Because if it's not, you need to know otherwise. And so I just, I think it's just important to like want to actually do the work and put in the time. But beyond that, I mean, yeah, like you've got to, got to learn and make mistakes, how to interview people. There's technical stuff, right? We're all in audio, like mics that don't work become a really big issue. So I think just like learning and kind of doing all that stuff um, and trial and error And I am always a big believer in seeking expert uh, opinion and information. If I've got something I don't understand, I need to take it to a criminal defense attorney to interpret it for me. I need to take it to a former homicide detective. I need to take it to whoever because I want to make sure that what I am interpreting is accurate and that I'm not putting out, you know, misinformation, which would harm a case or harm a story. So that's really big too, is building a network of sources, which is a journalist's best friend. (laughs) Yeah. The key takeaway I got there is it is a lot of work. (laughs) It is. It's not like you can just get up, you know, on a mic and just blab on and on. You can do that. But is that going to be something that's quality? Is that going to be something that makes a difference? Maybe, but not for me. Can I ask you just on a personal level, does that part where you're digging through thousands of pages feel like work for you or is it something that kind of fires you up? No, it definitely fires me up because I so I do a lot of that stuff oftentimes prior to really critical interviews so that I can gauge whether that individual is withholding from me or lying to me or whatever you, you know, whatever you can think of. So for me, I'm like, I want my ducks in a row so that I am prepared, and also to dealing with victims' families, I don't want them to think that I'm just some person off the street that knows nothing about this complicated case and just wants to 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 get everything from them and not give anything. So I it just a journalist's best friend is just to be prepared to go in and say, look, here's what I know, here's what I'm willing to to, you know, bring to the table. I actually have, you know, looked into this. I'm very curious. So I think it's just that that preparation. But no, it doesn't feel like work for me because I'm so like revved up and just ready to like, you know, go out there that it doesn't. But it is a lot of work for a person who is like, well, I just wanted to record a 10 minute episode and put it on YouTube or whatever, <laughs> like that's, you know, and there are people that do that are great. I, I applaud them. I just can't do that. <laughs> yeah. It also would be a different vibe for a true crime show if all you were doing was blabbing and there was no background for sure. So I'm assuming you found yourself in the position before where you've maybe interviewed someone and then your research goes against what they told you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not only research, what's actually been documented, it's, you know, corroborating interviews, it's it's other witness statements, it's, you know, conflicting interviews, it's conflicting statements from the same person. I mean, it's a it's a totality of all those things. But yes, I have had people lie to me multiple times. I have showed stuff to people and said, this is not what you said in such and such year. Why are you saying something different now? And, you know, obviously I try and be a little more approachable than that. But at, sometimes it gets to that point where you're just astonished that someone would be, you know, so hesitant to be truthful. It just makes you ask so many more questions as a journalist. So, I, I yeah, those situations are not for the faint of heart. And if you're not a people person, my job is not for you. Delia, thank you so much for your honesty and all of the answers you've your generosity. And um, I want to be sure our listeners know where to find you and and where to listen to your shows. Yeah, you can listen to all the shows um, from Audio Check on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, really any any platform. Dark Arenas is exclusive on Stitcher Premium, so you can use our code Arenas. Um, that'll give you one month of free listening on that. And if you want to follow me on social media, I'm constantly putting out stuff and little teasers and things. So I am on Twitter, Delia D'Amber TV. I'm also on Instagram, Delia.D'Amber.W. And you can find all the shows and stuff on Facebook and through Audio Chuck. So yeah, there's pretty much nowhere you can't find us. 
<laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe for updates on future episodes and leave us a comment with your feedback, questions, or ideas for future segments. If you would like more info on Ad Results Media and what we do, please visit us online at adresultsmedia.com. This podcast is an Ad Results Media production.